What's the worst nightmare for the careful collector? To be taken in by a brilliant fake. It's even happened on rare occasions to our experts. In this edition, we reveal all in this 100% genuine edition of Priceless Antiques Roadshow. We have a rare treat for you in this episode. Many of our longest standing and most familiar experts are giving us priceless exclusives. Ceramics expert David Batty reveals how he tells an original from a copy. OK, what do you think that is? Wood dust. Wood dust. Yeah. Absolutely dead right. This was not made very long ago. Oh. Eric Knowles reckons he has a hot tip for credit crunch collecting. They will make a, a slow but steady rise, um, but not before I've bought up every pair for under 50 quid I can find in the country. And Hilary Kay lifts the lid on a private passion. The revolving number plates and the machine guns and the oil slicks and the tin tacks and the smoke screen and the, the bulletproof screen and the ejector seat. Oh, spectacular. Now, is this or isn't it? Well... I don't know, but our team of specialists are among the best in the business at spotting fakes. Apparently, we are surrounded by them. So how can they tell? It's time for an introduction to the art of reproduction. You, you can't pussyfoot around it. Right. Well, I'm afraid it's bad news. I mean, how can you? You've got to tell the person that it's not right. I'm afraid it's very bad news. And, um... Yeah, I suppose I am blunt. It's a forgery. Is it? Not only is it a forgery, it is illegal. <gasps> Whoever made this put on a mark of a modern practicing factory, and that is against the law. That is a protected mark. Minton never actually made this particular dish. Don't get this crab on here. These colors don't exist. They didn't do this um, shredded clay effect. So where you bought it was breaking the law. Fakes are everywhere. Even a bishop can sometimes be deceived. I think if I've learnt one thing in my career over all these years, I've learnt a fair degree of tact. They belonged to Bishop Bradfield, who was the, uh, the bishop who stood on the left-hand side of the Queen at her coronation. We got the Bishop of Bath and Wells with his own sapphire ring, and I have the job to tell him that it's not quite what he thinks. Nightmare. It's not a real sapphire. Right. It's got bubbles inside it, which means that it's a man-made <laughs> sapphire. Right. right. And he took it on the chin, it has to be said, but I think it was a very uncomfortable moment. When you have to give the bad news, um, it's very, very difficult sometimes. Sadly, I have to tell you that it is actually a reproduction. You've just got to say, it's wrong. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. Got it. <laughs> That's all I can say. Sometimes one has to slightly have the skill of a, a social worker on the Antiques Roadshow um, managing uh, people's emotions and expectations um, or rather letting them down. You have what you believe to be the only existing portrait of Shakespeare done in his lifetime. Now, do you realise what a claim that is? What he'd brought in was a portrait that at first glance looked like Shakespeare had a pen in his hand, had the high dome that you expect uh, with the bard. Now, let's start with where did you get it from? OK, this painting we inherited from my great aunt, Doff, and she uh, was bequeathed this painting and she actually kind of staked her life on the fact that it was genuine and she collected a massive amount of documentation to say that it was. Despite the fact that he had an article by an eminent academic published, I think, in the 1950s or 60s, that it was just a concoction. <laughs> and I have to tell you that this picture is not 17th century, which is what it should be if it's Shakespeare, and I'm afraid it's not a Shakespeare either. It's of what I believed to be a cleric that has been adapted to look like Shakespeare. Now, have you seen the area, this sort of slightly ambiguous looking area at the top of his forehead? 
I must say I was always a little concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> With good reason, I might add, uh, because someone has actually extended his forehead to make that dome Goodness. look more Shakespeare-like. <laughs> Quite clever, eh? Goodness. Some devious restorer or artist had taken out a brush, adapted, added to, created the dome to make him look like the bard, put a pen and a hand in place, and had actually painted the Globe Theatre in the background. In the bottom left-hand corner, you see the Globe. The Globe. The Globe Theatre. Mm -hmm. That's so, right. So this is quite a sophisticated, probably 18th or might even be early 19th century construct. If this was the only portrait of Shakespeare done during his lifetime, such an emotive figure, you yes. would have collectors across the world scrambling to get <laughs> hold of it. Yes. As it is, it's worth about eight to 1,200 pounds as an mm -hmm. intriguing image. Yeah. Uh, with a bit of history mm -hmm. that uh, wants to be him, but sadly isn't. It's no good, it's this is no actually good, a dud. No it's, it's a direct copy after Claude Monet. Wrong material, wrong painting. It had to be wrong. I remember this wonderful girl down in Becks Hill who had got, she thought, a Hahn bronze and jade thing. This has got an amazingly ancient look about it. Yeah, that's because it probably is older than the Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't know. Older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> I was sure that I'd found something which was real. I was so adamant it was this antique relic from the hand period. Uh, a very unusual thing. Where did you find it? In a flea market in South East London a few years ago. It was kind of amongst those of just house clearance things and the guy didn't really seem very interested in it. These were grave goods. Right. Almost invariably they were buried and having been mm. dug up, you get this incrustation and you get all this wonderful colour building up here. Is it cast this bronze? Is, this is cast bronze yeah. and the copper is coming through. He was kind of giving me information about who would have had a relic like this, what period it was from. I should have looked more carefully at his twinkle and his eye, I think. Now, mm. how much did you pay for it? Well, he, he wanted like 50 pounds and I had no money and I bartered him down to 30 quid. <laughs> and I had to tell her that it was a dud. And she <laughs> practically, well, she did end up in my lap. Okay, now I'm gonna put you out of your misery. How old is it? couple of years. Oh no! Are you joking? Are you joking? Are you joking? I'm not. Oh no! I'm, I'm so sorry! Upset. I'm sorry! At first I felt kind of really angry at myself for being so stupid not to have de detected it was fake and I felt like hurling it into the sea. Oh god! <laughs> Thank you for being so brave. Oh, I'm so upset about I'm that. I'm sorry. Oh, it, it made me kind of excited to keep my eye open to look for more things. It's made me more adamant that one day I will find something. Perhaps the most famous fake uncovered in Roadshow history arrived in 2002. I still feel slightly uncomfortable watching it. There was a case um, in Chichester in the cathedral um, and a big Chinese chest had been brought in. Well, the story is that it was in an antique shop uh, and uh, having nothing better to do, I've found as a result of the antique Roadshow that uh, having one or two antiques might pay dividends in the long run. It was very deeply carved with warriors and stuff. <clears throat> and the owner was extraordinarily pleased at having discovered it. Not that I'm an, uh, in any way uh, knowledgeable about these things, but when I looked at the quality of the carving, it appealed to me. He'd uncovered it from centuries of grime and filth. Does anything strike you? Not in particular. Not that it's sort of kind of clean? Very clean, yes. OK, what do you think that is? Wood dust. Wood dust. Yeah. Absolutely dead right. This was not made very long ago. Oh. This actually dates from the 1960s. I'm sorry, rather no. disappointing. Well, no, no, if that's the truth, then obviously but one must accept the truth. You must accept the truth. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much for letting us see it. Not at all. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing. 1960. Thankfully, owner Fred tells us that whatever the Chet's age, he still loves it. You're no good, it's no good, it's no good, baby, it's no good. I'm gonna say it again, it's no good, it's 
no good, it's no good, baby, it's no good. I still like it. <laughs> so, just be careful next time you think you're onto a smart buy. Mind you, Eric Knowles thinks he's got a good idea. We've asked some of our leading specialists to see if they can predict sound financial investments deep in a recession. Now, one of the sort of most asked questions I'm forever being given is, uh, what's worth buying today? You know, what's a good investment? If I can introduce a, a matching pair of simple brass candlesticks. Now these date from the early 19th century. They could even be sort of George IV or William IV. And uh, if I was to turn one on its side, you can see that it's actually been turned because uh, the later ones tend to be sand cast and they're quite rough. The secret really is knowing how to recognize the early features. I'm really sort of going by that pleasing form, a ballast to shape, um, nice condition, not knocked about, and no visible repairs. So condition is paramount. I cannot see them going down in value. I would probably suggest that they will make a, a slow but steady rise. I just borrowed these from a, from a dealer friend of mine, um, and they are in his shop, uh, priced at 55 pounds. Now, I think that is real value for money. And um, I, I can't say any more. In fact, uh, I'm very tempted to send him a check in the post for them uh, because as we do live in uh, uncertain times, you never, ever know whether you're going to have to live through one, and, one more of those winters of discontent. Eric Knowles, a man with a secret past. He tells me that in his youth he was a northern soul boy, dancing the night away to the most obscure R&B records he could find. And quite a few of our specialists have surprising interests away from the show. Take miscellaneous expert Hilary Kay. Now, you probably associate her with cute dolls and teddy bears, but Hilary's true passions couldn't be further removed from the roadshow's cuddly stuff. Mechanical things is where I started from. I've always been interested in them. I come from a long line of chartered engineers, and I guess it's just come out in the genes. I think I was a tomboy. I, I never went through the real sort of dolly uh, phase. I, I, I was much more interested in things like Meccano and Lego. <laughs> Um, sadly, the bit of string that I've put on to make the governor work is not working, but if I give it a prod, it might. There we go. Ah, that's better. The way I ended up in antiques was, was really just a, a sort of uh, continuation of my interest in mechanical stuff, because one of the things that my grandfather had, he was this wonderful poly math, and he had a Victorian microscope. And when I used to stay with them, which I did from time to time, we used to use this microscope. And I suppose my path could have gone down two routes. I could either become a, I don't know, somebody who enjoyed looking at things down the microscope, but my path went the other way, which was I actually loved the engineering of this thing. In her teens, Hilary's love of all things technical found a new outlet in driving. Uh, the first car I ever bought myself was, <laughs> um, it was Betty. And Betty was a mini clubman estate. And Betty did sterling service um, until my first great love affair with a little sports car, a Fiat X19, which I loved to distraction. But it wasn't nearly as good as this, a uh, Porsche 911. Uh, then there was the 1950s Corvette, uh, a great favorite. I loved that car. Like driving a speedboat, really, but a great, great car for posing the Deville always used to break down and gave everybody enormous glee that there was this this great whale of a car bleeding radiator juice all over the floor. The Brighton car, Panard Lavassa, 1902, darling car. Then there was the XK, that is a great car. The Testarossa, give me a, uh, a 911 any day. I, I, what I must say, look, is I haven't owned all these cars. These are cars that I have known and loved to drive. 
This passion for cars was inspired at a tender age by none other than James Bond. The first time I saw Goldfinger, how could I possibly not remember that? Um, I was about, I must have been seven, I suppose. And it was the first adult film I'd ever been to see. This film was the most extraordinary glimpse into a world of glamour and excitement and danger. I've always wanted to drive an Aston Martin DB5. The car was the star. I mean, it was the, there in, in all its glory with all these incredible devices, the revolving number plates and the machine guns and the oil slicks and the tin tacks and the smoke screen and the, the bulletproof screen and the ejector seat and the others, oh, fabulous kind of Ben-Hur things that come out of the wheels and grind along the, the car of the girl. Ah, oh, spectacular. Hillary has come to Newport Pagnell to meet Kingsley Riding Fels, who's worked for Aston Martin for 33 years. Well, this is the area where customers' cars come back for servicing and repair. They come in from all over the world. We have them come in from the Middle East, from Europe. So this is our heritage department. This is where all the cars come back for the, uh, the heritage repairs. And as you can see, we've got practically a representation of every single model here today. DB4, DB5, the 6s, the V8s, everything. Um, you can't walk in here without not bringing a smile to your face, can you? It's wonderful. Putting the DB5 into context, I mean, the post-war austerity years in Britain, it was all pretty grim. Uh, and then with the 1960s, Britain became hip. The DB5 was, if you like, an embodiment of all that period of, of Britain becoming the centre of style. It was aspirational in a way that other cars weren't. It was the ultimate sort of sophisticated man's machine. And as you can see, there's various different models, and here yep. we have a DB5, and this is the actual car that was in the film, um, Casino Royale. No. Uh, yes, it was. This is the one that was used, in fact, the one that James Bond won in the card game. I'm going to stroke it gently. Yes. As if it was Daniel Craig. <laughs> <laughs> you wish it was. <laughs> I was sort of hoping to have a bit of a drive in this, but I can see, I'm afraid, this car is, is not fit for purpose. Not today, no. Um, it's nearly finished, but not quite. But it's very interesting because there were two cars that were used in the filming of the film Casino Royale. And the other one, the other DB5, is now finished. It's just completed its restoration, so you could drive that car today. Well, you'll make a girl very happy if that's the case. I tell you. I have to say, I never thought that this moment would ever happen. I mean, it's enough to turn a girl's head completely. If anybody asks what makes the DB5 special, they have lost the plot. The sound, the vision, the excitement, the emotion. As a seven-year-old, it became seared into my memory to drive a car that's actually made to give you a thrill is fabulous. It is one of those wish fulfillments. Hilary Kay, the road show's speed queen. Now, we like nothing more than making people happy as we travel around the country. And from the highlands of Scotland down to deepest Cornwall, our team have been able to put a smile on the most mournful of faces as we break the news that Granny's unloved vase has just broken the bank. Trawling the archives, it didn't take long to find some great examples. <laughs> Oh. I will get some of them out of each pair of What? 
John Sandon delivered a real bombshell moment at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea. I don't really know anything about it, just that it's been in the family for years. I think it belonged to my great-great-aunt. Um, and now my mother has it, but I know nothing. Um, we just have it for decoration. It's actually one of a pair. I was going past the Royal Hospital in Chelsea and I saw a large banner saying Antiques Roadshow coming here and I thought, oh, I can't believe my luck. What do you have is a, is a Trembler's Cup and Saucer, designed and named after people who had the trembles. It was intended for infirm people who uh, had shakes. The cup sits, sits very firmly inside the saucer there, so however much you've got a shaking hand, you can't possibly spill your coffee or chocolate. We never used it. I, I was aware, obviously, it was a functional item initially, but we never used it. It was just a decorative thing. To be honest, just collecting dust. Made by the Great Sayre factory. And the quality is just so sumptuous. So a pair of them. Yes. Right. And the other one's in just as good a condition that's as so this in, one. That's so important too. Yeah. Because I mean, a single cup and saucer of this quality, it's going to be pushing £5,000. <laughs> <laughs> You're joking. Frankly, I had no idea that it was going to be as much as it was, hence my overt reaction, I think. So a pair of this quality, it's absolutely stunning, £10,000. So when he said, as a pair, they're worth £10,000, I think I probably could have fallen over if I'd been given half a chance. And I think things that went through my head probably were better to stay in my head than, than what I actually said. You need a steady hand in order Crikey. to take that in. Absolutely. You? Maybe you should hold on to it for a bit longer. <laughs> we put the pieces into auction and we got a good price for them and bought a car. <laughs> More functional, not as pretty. <laughs> Rupert Mars has a favourite memory of a painting that made its owner and him very happy indeed. One of my favourite pictures, perhaps my favourite picture in, in the roadshow. I knew that this was just the most wonderful Alfred William Hunt I'd ever seen. It was an astonishing watercolour, quite, quite wonderful. So, it's by Alfred William Hunt, and we can see bottom right there, and it's signed, uh, and it's dated 1869. I love it. Do you? I do. Love this completely wonderful painting. <laughs> um, the way you can see through to the valley beyond, this hoosh, that rainbow, that boat and its tiny tender and the waterfall and where do you want me to stop? Well, because it just goes, it just goes on forever, doesn't it? Wonderful painting, completely wonderful painting. And what's more, you know, uh, it's not known to academia. You know, this is a, a lost masterpiece. There's been an exhibition, just don't literally. Tell him. What? Don't, <laughs> don't tell him. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> we'll keep. It'll be our secret. A picture this good, this rare, of this date by this artist, at least £40,000. <laughs> Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> she really was a, a very likeable yeah. character. She was later able to sell the picture, and I was able to give her some good advice in the doing of it. And it was great because she just lost her job, and the money pretty well saved her house. So that was a very good ending. And at a busy fun fair, ceramics man John Axford made Helen Dixon's day. Who owns these? I do. You sure? Well, they belong to my boyfriend's aunt. She was from Poland. I didn't think they were worth anything, obviously. They looked like they'd been um, bought, you know, on a holiday in Portugal or something, so I wasn't expecting them to be worth anything. So I ran out of the door, uh, greasy hair, horrible old top, no makeup. I'd had no idea how it worked and whatever type of um, antique you had, so mine was ceramics, I was put into a particular queue, um, which was very fortunate because he was a very handsome expert on our table. Do you know where they're from? No. No idea. Have you ever looked at them properly? Yes, no. but uh, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I don't know what the bottom means. There's some well, stuff on the bottom. There is stuff on the bottom. It says Bermontoff's Faience. Yeah. It's a factory in uh, Leeds in Yorkshire. Near my hometown. Excellent. Looking good. Looking good. Uh, they do. They look lovely. They date from, well, just before 1890, around about 1880, 1885, that sort of period. Wow. Goodness. So, Older than I thought, actually. They are copies. When the expert John was telling us about them, he said they were copies 
And as soon as I heard that word copy, I forgot everything else that he said and heaved a big sigh because I thought, oh, there's no way they're going to be worth anything. When I first saw them, there's a designer at the end of the Victorian period called William de Morgan. They look just like de Morgan vases. But they're not. They're not William oh, de Morgan no. vases. Who did they they are Islamic. Did I've told you that. They're Bermontos fails. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> And what do you want to know? How much they're worth. Know how much they're worth, yeah. I feel dreadful now when I look back at the, the tape because I just look so... All I was interested in was how much were they worth, but um, at the time, <laughs> that was what I was interested in. You're laughing. Well, it is quite funny. <laughs> this one's worth about £3,000 because it's damaged. <gasps> this, I'm going to cry. <laughs> this one isn't damaged. <gasps> how much is that worth? Somewhere between five and eight thousand. <laughs> Can I kiss it? Goodness me! <laughs> Do you want to buy them? <laughs> I wanted to kiss him when he said there was, you know, they were worth what they were worth, and I apologise now that I did that on television. <laughs> That's terrific. Really get them home. <laughs> I know. Well, it's going to take. We didn't even wrap them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I view these vases differently now. Um, they suddenly seem a lot prettier <laughs> because they're worth a lot of money. You know how a man looks more handsome when he's got loads of money? It's that sort of effect, I think. Um, and, you know, I did marry the boyfriend at the time who inherited them, just in case there's something else in the family. And if you were looking on enviously, why not join us at a roadshow? You might just find your luck's in. Next time, we revisit some of the most moving stories that the show has ever seen. And it says, made great mistake, which means a lot. That's right. And clearly he'd done something terrible and he absconded. He, he walked off, walked away, and they never heard or saw from him again. Our furniture experts go back to their roots it's amazing what you two have done today. <laughs> really? like we've fallen between two that. stools, John, I think. <laughs> oh, dear. And we take another look at roadshow finds that have been touched by the stars. He took the ring off his finger. And That's Jimi Hendrix's ring? Yes. So he gave you that? Yeah. It looks like something out of a Christmas cracker. I know. <laughs> <laughs> look at it. <laughs> I'll leave you with a quick clip from our outtake tape. Pictures expert Rupert Mars committed a cardinal sin in the world of broadcasting and it was caught on camera. Bye bye. It's now come back to Britain again. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a terrific thing, actually, in a way. Uh, um, I, I think, you know, in terms of. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> a cardinal sin for any presenter, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank goodness it was at a convenient. I'm so sorry. I've told you not to bother me in the office. <laughs> How many times must I tell you? The store went 10%. Yeah, <laughs> sell them all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>